Um, wow, it got quiet. <laughs> I wanted to uh, share something with you. Um, those of you that have been to church already know that we've got um, Mr. David Berry sharing with the Gideons, um, and uh, he will be doing the same at the second service. But I just wanted to make sure that I could clarify something that you are going to hear repeatedly and or you already heard repeatedly in the service, which is about giving one's heart to Jesus. I think it needs to be, um, I, I struggle with this. I've always had an internal struggle, and it's a long story. Ask me about it sometime outside of class here. But um, I have, uh, I have um, a belief in the work that the Gideons are doing and putting the word of God into people's hands. But I also um, I struggle with having someone take the, the, he wasn't in the pulpit, he was in the lectern, or having a screen, something on the screen that actually purports a theology that is different than ours, okay? So maybe you heard a bunch of talk about giving one's heart to Jesus. And um, I want to start with scripture real quick just to refute this and why we refute this. Um, I've talked about this before. I've put it up on the board before where I've talked about how um, until the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, and enlightens this whole Christian church on earth, which is the third article of the Apostles' Creed, then no action can happen of our own volition. I cannot give my heart to Jesus by my own volition. It starts with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit doing that work within me. And that comes from Scripture. I want to tell you what the heart is. This is from Genesis 6, starting at verse 5. Remember the context, pre-fall. Okay? The, oh, not pre-fall, sorry, pre-flood. Pre-flood. Um, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What did this cause the Lord to do? Verse 6, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. What's a heart worth? Christ gave himself for us and he moves our hearts to action, but... If you listen to what it says here, every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. Three very exclusive words there. That means every, bar none. No thought of man's heart is towards God. Every intention of man's heart is only evil continually. Always, without fail, without end. So we have to remember that. The other thing that I brought real quick, and I was back in my office quick looking it up, is um, a book called The Hammer of God. We read this for, for um, seminary. I think a couple of you have probably heard me talk about this before. It's Bo Geertz. He was a Swedish theologian. And it's, a, it's the scene of a church in Sweden at three different phases in history with three different pastors. And in the second story, there's a little um, piece in here that I want to share with you. Um, it's an old pastor talking to a young pastor who was very much on fire and very much anxious to talk about how he had given his heart to the Lord. Okay, I know reading to people, it's like a little story time, pull up a chair, pastor's going to read a story. But um, the character's names uh, are Fridfelt is one of the character's names, and then the old man is who they talk about. So his superior. Okay, so Fridfelt seated himself on the sofa, feeling that he must not put off confessing where he stood. This strange old man with his brandy and his soldiers should at least learn of what kind of assistant that he had gotten. Fridfelt was the new vicar to serve under the old pastor. Um, I just want you to know from the beginning, sir, that I am a believer, Fridfelt said, his voice a bit harsh. He saw a gleam in the old man's eyes, which he could not quite interpret. Was approval indicated or did he have something up his sleeve? The old rector put the lamp back on the table, puffed at his pipe, and looked at the young man a moment before he spoke. So you're a believer. I'm glad to hear that. What do you believe in? Fridfelt stared dumbfounded at his superior. Was he jesting with him? But sir, I'm simply saying that I'm a believer. Yes, I hear that, my boy, but what is it that you believe in? Fridfelt was almost speechless. But don't you know, sir, what it means to be a believer? That is a word which can stand for things that differ greatly, my boy. I ask only what it is that you believe in. Well, in Jesus, of course, answered Fridfelt, raising his voice. I mean, I mean, I've given him my heart. The older man's face became suddenly solemn as the grave. Do you consider that something to give him? By this time, Fridfelt was almost in tears. But sir, if you do not give your heart to Jesus, you cannot be saved. You are right, my boy. And it is just as true that if you think you're saved because you give 
Jesus your heart, you will not be saved, you see, my boy. He continued reassuringly as he continued to look at the young pastor's face in which he uncertainty and resentment were shown in a struggle for the upper hand. It is one thing to choose Jesus as one's Lord and Savior, to give him one's heart and commit oneself to him, and that he now accepts one into his little flock. It is a very different thing to believe on him as a redeemer of sinners, of whom one is chief. One does not choose a redeemer for oneself, you understand, nor can one give one's heart to him. The heart is a rusty old can on a junk heap. A fine birthday gift indeed. But a wonderful Lord passes by and has mercy on the wretched tin can. He sticks his walking cane through it, and he rescues it from the junk pile, and he takes it home with him. That's how it is. I have that highlighted in this book from the very first time I read it. I thought, what a beautiful passage. And I was struck with it sitting in there listening to you know the repeated given my heart to Jesus, given my heart to Jesus. And um, I know we want, and I think it's important to address this, we want some role in this transaction between us and God. We want some control over it is what it amounts to. I want to be able to have a say in this, right? The fact is, our salvation lies outside of our reach, our hands. It's the Lord's work. And there's nothing that you can do that can affect what the Lord does apart from rejecting what he has given to you, okay? And by reception, when we talk about reception of God's salvation, reception of faith, etc., that is purely a work of the, of the Holy Spirit who comes to us through word and sacrament, okay? So I don't mean to turn this into a lecture or sound angry or, or you know, private, like, oh, we, but I want to make sure that we have a clear understanding of this. Because it is my role to be the teacher here at this place and to have responsibility for what is taught in our sanctuary. Which maybe I should have said it in there, but I just I want to make sure that we believe. What we believe is from and informed by the scriptures and not maybe what one wants to, to have a part of this. Did I see a hand somewhere? Okay. Are we okay on this? I think we. I think people are. I think you know, Lutherans. We can look at this and we can go. I, I appreciate the work that they're doing. Absolutely appreciate the work that they're doing. And I've I've myself been in a hospital room when I didn't have a Bible. This is before the days of smartphones. Been sitting in a hospital room and had a Gideon Bible to be able to pick up and take a look at. Okay. Now let me take it to a, just a little lighter note. For those of you that were in church this morning, we read from Amos chapter I think four. Uh, I got informed that there was a. Uh, a typo? <laughs> it said something about um, they will drink bowls full of wine, but it said bowels. <laughs> Listen, I don't want anybody in the room drinking a bowel full of wine. Okay, so just keep your bowels <laughs> to yourselves. <laughs> We're working to correct the screens. <laughs> All right. Are we okay on this other stuff? I just want to make sure that we know... Um, for it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. This is the gift of God so that no one may boast. It's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And um, I, as I said, I feel responsible for correcting a teaching. The short addition to this story is when I was back in Nebraska, the Gideons would come, call, and, and we had one guy that was particularly persistent. And his name was, it was spelled just like my name, Kevin, but he told me he insisted it's Keevan Gertzen. Pronounce it Keevan. And um, so he came a couple of years in a row. He was the head guy for the area. And, and um, he would come with his family. And he sat in front of my family one Sunday. And um, throughout the service, it, it was him, his wife, and two daughters. And throughout the service, Amy sat behind him. And he didn't know Amy was my wife. And he kept whispering to his wife. I'd say something from the pulpit. And he'd whisper. Sh -sh -sh. And then he got up and he did his part and took five minutes to correct everything that I had said in the service and set everyone in the church straight because he said, well, Pastor McReynolds spoke in error. So the next year when he came calling and wanted to set up and do his presentation, I said, no, thank you. And um, so anyway, I've always sort of had a bit of a, you know, I didn't, I didn't appreciate that being done. I think there's a level of respect. And I do believe that David, um, Mr. Barry um, has done a nice job. Um, I just wanted to correct a couple of things that we saw today. So, okay on that?
All right, very good. All right, I said I wanted to try and finish this, and I really do. Um, I misled you guys last week uh, because I picked up at a point that we had already covered. That we're talking about um, what Lutherans emphasize and what Lutherans believe. And I think it's important as we move into this piece of, the, of this presentation that we understand what the scriptures say regarding um, the Lord's saints. Is that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. God does not take lightly the death of his children, his people. And so he does something about it. He redeems us. And he doesn't want it to be something that's, um, he wants to take away the terror for us. He wants to take away the fear. And um, it's a tough thing. Maybe a quick word on this because Jim is going to say something at the end here um, regarding um, Vern Ash. Vern is not here with us today. Vern, um, as many of you know, had uh, COVID for a time, um, has suffered a fall, a couple of falls actually and um, is at Hiram Shattuck's right now. And I've, his whole family has been here kind of working with some of his things, you know, trying to help him get back to home. But it's looking more and more like he's not going to be able to get back to his home, but will likely be at Good Sam. And in the middle of all this kind of stuff going on, I got a call one of the days um, in the last week or two from one of his daughters. And she said, could you come over and encourage dad? He was down. And um, so we went over and, and I visited with him, just he and I, and um, he was down. It's as down as I've ever seen him, actually. And um, one of the things that I reflected on him when I was talking to him, and this is my words, so I'm not giving you anything that's personal, private on his part and breaking confidence in that way, but I want you to understand one of the things that I shared with him was, I said, the Christian, you know, we cling to this word of scripture that says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And we believe that in, in full. Paul writes this. He says, um, you know, for me to live, I live for Christ. But if I die, I gain. I gain peace. I gain comfort. I gain what Jesus talked about in the, in the um, gospel lesson today, like Lazarus got to experience. Lazarus had a great reversal, and he went from being the poorest of the poor to being in the riches and mercy and grace of God in heaven and to be cared for. And, and sometimes when things get you down like Vern was getting, um, I walked into the room and I shared with him, I said, it's tough as a pastor because I know that you know this truth for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. What I don't want that to become for you is excuse to give up, to say I'm done and I, I want to die now. I fought the good fight, I finished the race, and now it's time. Um, because what I told him, and remember what I went into the room to do was to encourage him. I told him, listen, you're alive. God's given you the gift of life for yet another day. And um, as I hopefully have emphasized with you guys from the very beginning of this, every moment of every day, the Christian who has been redeemed by Christ has this at the, co at the core of their purpose. Because you've got to help somebody find their purpose in a moment like that. Their purpose is to glorify God. Always, forever. If you have to think about your purpose and you can't find any other purpose you know, to be a spouse to my, to my husband or wife, to be a father to my children or a mother to my children, a grandparent to my grandkids, uh, a coworker. Um, however you find your purpose, people find their purpose in a lot of things. But if, if you get down to the nitty gritty in a moment like that, your purpose as a baptized believer is to glorify God. If you have no, if you can't find any other purpose than that, Find that one. So what I, I told him was, I said, you've got lots of purposes. And maybe they're not the ones that you think that they are. Maybe some of your purpose is that you need to exist with your neediness to teach somebody how to care for you. To be the subject of someone else learning to stop caring about themselves in their own selfishness and start giving to you. Maybe that's why the Lord has you in this state. But your purpose is always and forever to glorify God. And in this moment, you are alive. So rather than longing for death, long for fulfillment of the purpose that God's put you here for. And as I told him, I said, and I've used this one before with people, I'm a whole lot better husband. I'm a whole lot better father. I know for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. If I died walking out the door, um, you know, or dropped over dead, Okay, I'm in the peace and comfort of God's mercy in heaven. And I trust that implicitly, okay? But I'm not anxious to do it yet. I'm in no hurry. I am a better husband, a better father, a better 
um, pastor and teacher and leader of this church and overseer, as it's in, written in today's epistle lesson, alive than I am if I'm dead. Okay? And while I'm alive, I'm going to give glory to Christ in every way possible. I'm going to teach about the truth of his word. I'm going to share with people. And it's my purpose. Okay? Does that make sense? So I think when I put this slide up here and I say, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, God doesn't take it lightly, neither should you. Does that make sense? Don't undersell yourself. If you have breath in your lungs and a beat in your heart, then you have purpose. The Lord's got you here and he's got you here for a reason. You might be the weakest of them all. And your purpose to exist might be just to train someone else on how to care for you and love you and stop thinking about their own selfish needs and start thinking about you. If that's your only purpose, good. Serve in that purpose. You are, and you guys all know this as well as I do, your phases in life, they change. The things that you find your purpose in sort of changes, but under undergirding them all, the foundation of it all is to glorify God. Okay? So God doesn't take it lightly, neither should you. Um, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All are justified freely by his grace. This goes back to um, what I started with a little bit here. Um, we don't make a decision. And I, I made a comment and nobody, nobody got squirmy in their chair when I made it, but I'll make it again and just see if I make you squirm now with your bowels full of wine. <laughs> um, I, said, uh, I said, you can no more choose or take control of the situation. One of the reasons people want to give their heart to Jesus is because they want to be the ones who control that interaction with God. They want to have some role, no matter how small it is. Nobody squirmed at that. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Anyone? I, yeah, yeah. Zap us into faith. Yeah. Yeah. Lutheran, sort of Lutheran theology puts it this way. Stop resisting the Holy Spirit. There's only one way. There's only one sin that's unforgivable. Right, right. We resist the work of the Holy Spirit. So in the, in the terms of the sermon today, how do I resist the work of the Holy Spirit? Well, you can do it, I, I've always taught it, actively or passively. Active is the one most people recognize. Active rejection of God's Holy Spirit is to resist or reject the ways that he gives himself to us. How does God give himself to us? Through the word and through the sacrament, as through instruments, God gives faith. That's what we say in Augsburg Confession, Article 4. So through hearing the word, faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of the Lord, Romans 10, 17. This is why I'm all about getting Gideon Bibles out there. People need to hear the word. People need to engage the word, okay? Because faith comes from hearing. Faith comes from engaging that word. When someone doesn't read the word of God, when someone doesn't attend regular worship, when's, what's regular worship? Why did I say regular worship? Every Sunday is every Sabbath day is what the Lord commanded. Third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Jim Hitch has told me this more times than I can remember. He says, you're the first pastor I've ever heard say that it's a sin not to go to church on Sunday. Why have other pastors not said this? Are they not teaching their catechisms? Probably. I mean, I'm not trying to be critical of other pastors. I'm just saying that's a no-brainer to me. Right? Regular worship. Jesus, it even says in the Gospel of Luke, this whole Gospel we've been working on, it says Jesus was in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. Well, if Jesus is going every Sunday, what are you doing when you're skipping? It's a sin if you don't go. God gets to decide what is a sin and what isn't a sin. You skip, you're taking a chance in resisting the work of the Holy Spirit, rejecting it. It's not the 10 suggestions. I love it. 
<laughs> it's the Ten Commandments, right? So we, we want some role in this because this is the way that I sort of rendered it when I was at seminary. If I don't have a role in it, well, that's kind of a terrifying place to be, to think that my future salvation is 100% totally in the hands of God. That's terrifying to think that I'm not in control of something. And what that reveals to me very quickly is what's the first and worst sin that Adam and Eve did? They wanted to be like a God in charge of their own. And what we have to do is we have to say, no, God is God. Let God be God. Let God do what God does. I'm not a God. Yes. Oh, yeah. So I said active rejection. Everyone is familiar with active rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit. Active rejection is, la, 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 I don't want to hear you. I'm not going to go where your word is being preached. I don't want to take part in your sacraments. I don't want any part of where God's word is being given or God's sacrament is being given. I got better things to do. It's NFL Sunday, don't you know? Especially for all of you who have rescinded your love for college sports. <laughs> um, so... You know, or whatever reasons people have. I want to be on the lake. It's my time. It's the only chance I get to get a break. Blah, blah, blah. You know, everybody's got all kinds of reasons. Or I don't believe that. I don't want that. That's active rejection. Passive rejection. And this is one that we got to think about a little bit. And it confounds and frightens us. Is I say passive rejection in some examples that I'll give you. Little kids that are three, four, five years old who can't get in the car and drive themselves to church. And they're rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit because they're not in church. They're not hearing the word. Why? Because mom or dad is not doing their duty that they've been given to do, which is to bring the kids so that they can be in the hearing of God's word. And is it the kid's problem? It's the kid's problem. But is it the kid's fault? No, they're passively rejecting this stuff because they never had the chance to actively hear it. We got a problem at this church right now that I came face to face with on Wednesday night after, after confirmation classes. I got a parent that's saying, you know what? After Odyssey Sunday School, which is really designed around younger kids, and it is an amazing program that Donna Brown has put together. After Odyssey Sunday School, we don't really have anything for these kids. They hit fifth, sixth grade. And they, they want more than they're getting there. And they don't want to just be helpers in Sunday school so that we can then fail them in middle school and high school and not provide for their needs. And then young adults, you know, dad, where are their good 25, 20 to 25 year old Lutheran boys? <laughs> oh, I'm going to be busted for that one later. <laughs> That didn't come, well, that was dad, you know, and I, I make it sound like it was her. It wasn't her. Well, it has been her, but it was someone else that was saying that. Not my family. We're the young 20 to 25 year old Lutheran boys because we can't find any for our kids. They've been looking elsewhere. That's frightening for me too as a dad, you know? And it's because people are passively rejecting this word. Um, I have on my screen, on my computer, in my office right now, two separate tabs open on my internet browser that have an article that cites from Pew Research. You guys get tired of hearing me talk about this stuff. Pew Research is talking about the failure in America for adults to raise their children in God-fearing houses because they've done the statistical analysis and research of how many kids are persisting in the faith. It's, it's not a website. I just have two screens open that had, it's cited from a study and it was on Yahoo News this past week. But the, the place that does the work, it's Pew Research, P-E-W. Pew, 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 pew. Like Star Wars. <laughs> Sorry. Pew, no, pew is like in pews in the church. Not pew, like whew. Someone's got a bowel full of wine. <laughs> See you to carry on. Um, I can go till... I'll be here all day. <laughs> Tip your servers and try the veal. So um, passive rejection is, is you don't have a choice in the matter. You're rejecting it without even knowing it. 
That could, that could include people who've never heard the word of God, who live on some remote you know, tropical island somewhere that have never had access to the word of God, which is, again, why I go back to the Gideon's work and say, great work. We're all behind it. Keep the theology out of it. Let's let the word do what the word does. Okay? I mean, let, once you get the word in someone's hand, I trust that the word of God is powerful and effective. I absolutely trust it. So the testimonies that the guy on the video is giving about being at, at um, you know, boot camp and, and when he was an atheist, when he went into the military and came out after having read the Gospel of John as a believer, um, I'm not going to deny that stuff. I think God can work faith through simple reading and interaction with his word, but I think it takes more than that, which is why God gave the pastoral office. And that's why we have stuff like 1 Timothy chapter 3, the epistle reading for today, that God has requirements for people who fulfill this office to do the teaching ministry, to do the administration of the sacraments, and to do the right you know, dictation of God's word to God's people, and to be diligent and faithful in doing that. So, and, and what does it say? It says, and I'm not saying that other people are just all you know, new at this, but it also says they shouldn't be a recent convert lest they become puffed up and filled with conceit and mess things up and fall into the condemnation of the devil. You should have somebody that's got um, a background, an education, a history in this stuff. You should expect the best, right? Too bad for you guys. You're not getting it. We're working on that. <laughs> all have sinned and fall short of the, for the glory of God. They are all justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came in Christ Jesus. So salvation this time of salvation that we can enjoy from the time between death and life and resurrection, that is given not lightly by God, but it is cared for and overseen by God. And this is the beauty of the message. When I said before, you've got people that want to take control of that, that interaction and say, this is mine to do. I'm going to give my heart to Jesus. I would say, no, God cares so much that he will worm his way into your life some way whether it's through the gift of a small testament that you carry in your pocket. And it could be that. But I tell you this, I helped start a mission congregation in Aurora, Nebraska. And when I first got involved with it, people went, oh, good. We, I was younger then. And they're like, oh, good. We got a young pastor that's helping us with a young family. This will help us get started. And people look for pastors like that. We want to, and they're harder and harder to find. Only 33 men this fall signed up to become pastors at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. 33 men total for their incoming class, okay? I can tell you this because I know because I interviewed with them. They had projections of a minimum of 42 per year for the next six years from the time that I had interviewed with them. That was their plan, and they're not meeting it. So I got a letter, an email this last week, if you know of anybody that's interested. Not only do we not have young men in the church to marry our young daughters off to, but we don't have any of them starting into the ministry either. And that's frightening because we need qualified men. And it doesn't mean we should just take any of them that come along. It means we need to still find the best of the best and put them in there and put them through school. And I was a young guy and I was getting started helping this mission congregation. And they go, oh, as a young guy, he's got a young family. This will be perfect for us. And when I got there, they go, well, what are you going to do to help us start this mission church? Are you going to go door to door and start knocking on doors? And I'm like, no. I told them, you're going to talk to people. You know your community. Talk to the people that you work with and that you play with and that you engage with during the week. Talk to your next door neighbor. Hey, we're, I'm getting started in this new church. You should come. How hard is that? But people don't want to do it. You know, the easiest thing to do is invite somebody. And usually people are just waiting around to be invited. You get them here and then I'll take care of that. Ron. Maybe it's just going to come and you, you fuck a little bit. Because years and years ago, Pastor Lansing started something in the cult. Friend Sunday, and I knew a guy through another friend that was nominally had been a Lutheran way back. And I kept saying, "Why don't you come? You know, see what like these different things." And finally, one day I, I bumped into him again. I said, "You know, Carl, this coming Sunday, bring a friend Sunday. You're my friend. Why don't you come?" He said, "I think I will." He died a practicing, church-going, Sunday regular, actually Saturday night regular guy. But it was that invitation, finally. I mean, I invited them several times, but it was that 
bring a friend Sunday, that rang a bell with him. You're my friend, why not come? God's Spirit, God's Holy Spirit works through means. The means of the Word, the means of sacrament. Guess what? He works through the means of his body of believers. Yeah, he works through me. But I don't want to get into that whole story, so I won't. I was going to say, I got to hold it. I'd keep you bogged down for a while now. Yeah. Excuse me. Bringing up something that's benign that needs to be started to talk about work. Jim and I went to see Burning yesterday also. Jim and I called them frequently during the week just to check on them and make sure he's okay. We don't understand the value of that little ear thing that we hold in our hand. Mm -hmm. Because we're all on our computers, and we all think we can't make a telephone call anymore. God forbid we have to be in contact with people. Yeah. But just hearing another voice. When we got there, he was on the phone with a friend in Peoria that he had gone to school with way back. In this community, when you said, who else from church would come to see you? He said, nobody. He lied. Well, he Jim and I no, I shouldn't say that. He said no. He said pastor has been there. Jim Hitch has been there. Yeah. See, this is the value of the Barnabas ministry that we were working to get up and running, is keeping the body of Christ connected to the body of Christ. The hand can't be a hand unto itself, right? It's got to be connected to the body. So this, this, um, and get this, the Greek word, I don't have John Templeton here to tell me if I'm spelling it right or not. <laughs> Koinonia means, it translates into Latin, communio, and it translates into English, communion, communication, fellowship, union. The Lord invites us into union, into his body. You know, I've told you about this before. The husband and the wife relationship is given by God as a gift to us, okay? It's, it's not to be enjoyed in heaven. We'll get to that in this Bible study. Not today, but during the course of this study about what does the heavenly realm look like. Um, and I've told you that Paul writes in Ephesians 5.33 that the man and the woman relationship, the husband and the wife relationship, is to model and reflect Christ and his bride, the church. And what do we know about the man-woman relationship? The two shall become one flesh. And everyone goes, oh, that's just a sexual union. No, it's a mind-body-spirit union between the husband and the wife. So now I have, yes, I have a sexual reunion or a connection to my wife, but I have more than just that. We have a mind, a body. We are of one body together. We are of the same mind together. So now, if I'm with her in some place, I can communicate with her. I'm in fellowship with her. And now if I give her a look like this, she knows exactly what I'm thinking. <laughs> because we're of the same mind and body and spirit, okay? And I'm going to get a look from her. That's why I'm not looking in her direction because I said, <laughs> talked about the rest of the union that goes with this whole thing. But this union of man and woman, husband and wife, is meant to reflect another union, the bigger union, the one that it's meant to talk about is Christ and his bride, the church, who have a one body, mind, spirit union with each other. And they think alike. They know each other. They're in constant communication, communion, fellowship with one another. They're indivisible. And what happens when you get a part of this body that gets separated out from it and can't be with us on a Sunday is you got to go to extra efforts to go and connect them and make them know that they're still a part of this body, even though they can't join with us. I got a little fired up about that, didn't I? <laughs> and, and this is how bad, I mean, think about the, the shepherd who leaves the 99 to go get the one. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about. We can't let them be, you know, separated from us. Uh, I don't know if you guys watch the news. I mean, I watch, I read the news. I try and pay attention to stuff. So at least I'm sort of current on current events, but I hate the news also because I hate how it positions itself. I hate how it lords its power over people and their minds and things like that. And I think it's got a goal of always leading us to the train wreck instead of bringing us to the good, you know, all that stuff. There's a lot of reasons I hate the news. 
but I still pay attention because I know people watch the news very carefully. Okay. And um, when you see the news that's out there, just this is the late, latest in the last two days about Putin, you know, threatening nuclear war. And now the, all the pundits, are, the um, analysts are coming out and they're talking about, well, you know, this is a new place that we're finding ourselves at because he's been, this was something people feared was Putin backed into a corner. And that he might do something now with his nuclear weapons because he's finding that his army has been ineffective, you know, and, and that um, the people of Ukraine have been fighting him back, etc. And, and, you know, now what do we do? And I'm like, man, what does this do to people when you're constantly under hearing this kind of, you know, doom and gloom all the time? And I'm not an uh, ostrich who wants to shove his head in the sand and ignore all this stuff. But what people will often do, and I'm guilty of it as well, is I go, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. I pray that. And I do. But when I do it, I always catch, it's just catch 22. I catch myself and I'm like, stop. Because what would happen if Jesus came today? If he answered that prayer, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. I'm here. What do you need? You know, what happens if he shows up today? There is a whole lot of people that are not going to be saved. People that I know and people that I love and care for. This is, yeah, this is why I think it's a matter of bringing us back to what I said before. Our job as Christians, as the now shrinking and aging body of, well, aging and I'm not shrinking, I'm actually growing, you know, but the shrinking body of Christ is to make sure that the ones we have, we don't lose. <laughs> that's, a, that's a key thing, stop the bleeding. But secondly, then, to see if we can't build it up by sharing it with other people, by giving it in ways that are unique. And, and winsome. You know, not by, uh, you brood of vipers, you're all going to hell if you don't come to church. That's not helpful. Right? Hey, you know, I know something. I'd love to have you come join in. I got a group of people that I think are high quality folks. <laughs> and you might like to meet them too in this community. You know, what a nice winsome way to invite somebody in. Or when somebody's suffering, you know, a friend of yours that's suffering a tragedy or a difficult time. Hey, you know, we'd love to help you. Is there a way that we can help? What can I do for you? Um, I know some people that would talk to you, some people that would just care for you. So anyway, all right. That's what's so great. And the beauty of all this is that God calls and he gathers and he lighten, enlightens the whole Christian church on earth through his Holy Spirit and he handles the work. If it was up to me, I would bomb it. I live in the town of the bombers, but I would blow it. But God does it. It's sola gratia, sola fide, sola scriptura. This is what we believe. We believe that only through grace, only through faith, only through the word of God does this happen. This is what we stand by. Okay? Um, so Lutherans emphasize the holiness and the goodness of Christ alone and Christ is given to us through these gifts. He shared in our humanity, right? God knows our humanity. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And we learn that in Hebrews 2. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. He took of the same things that we endure, that we go through. He knew what it was like to be hungry. He knew what it was like to have emotions. He knew what it was like to live our lives and to be without and to be wanting at times so that he can relate to us and he becomes knowable in that way. And likewise, he partook of the same things that through death, he even went through death so that by death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. I'm not slave to death. The, the fear of death any longer. I've told you I'm not anxious to go through it, but I'm also not afraid of what awaits me on the other side because God has revealed it to me that I have no cause for, for concern or fear. Uh, maybe a quick word is appropriate at this point about our gospel reading today that I preached on um, because it is a parable that Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus. Okay? Um, a lot of people have gone, theologians have gone maybe in some ways too far using that particular text to, to state what they believe is going to be 
things are going to be like in the, in the time after death, right? So the details that are contained in the story, for instance, like poor Lazarus is brought to be by Abraham's side and Abraham can see through the chasm. Isn't that strange to anybody as you hear that story? But Lazarus can't. The rich man who dies and goes to Hades or to hell, he can see through the chasm and he can communicate with Abraham. That's weird. Aren't there some details in that story where you're going, what does this tell us about what it's going to be like after we die? That's why I'm here to remind you that that's only a parable that Jesus told. It doesn't necessarily tell us exactly what it's going to be like. It can be informative for us, but in all of its details, you got to remember that parables, as you study the parables of Jesus, what you learn quickly is that Jesus would oftentimes overemphasize things to the point of almost ridiculousness in order to teach a lesson. They're like Aesop's fables in a sense. You teach a lesson through telling this story, and now we can give you the, here's the bottom line, here's the summary, here's the moral of the story. So when we look at that story, when we have it as our gospel today, what was the real issue that Jesus was trying to attack? No. No. I'll go with that, but what was his, who was the, what was Jesus speaking against when he told the story of the rich man and Lazarus? He was speaking against the Pharisees who did two things. They loved their money and they were ridiculing Jesus. I said it in the sermon. Though That's the problem that's going on in the text. So what does Jesus do to answer the problem of the Pharisees who love their money and themselves and ridicule Jesus? Jesus tells a parable about Lazarus and the rich man, okay? And it's a great reversal that he talks about. And what does he want for the Pharisees? He wants a great reversal. He wants their hearts to be broken and to turn away from their love of money and to stop ridiculing him. Not because he just said, don't make fun of me. No, the ridicule was they didn't believe he was the Christ. It's verse 14. It's Luke 16, 14. They didn't like Jesus taking over their powerful positions that they were in. So Jesus told a story. We've got to keep it as that in our minds, okay? But the story has as its core a great reversal. And Jesus, what does he do? He's welcoming people. He's saying, look, there's a chance for great reversal. And I did this in the sermon with you guys. I said, what do you get when you look in the mirror? I see dead people. Okay, but I know that there's a great reversal. I see a dead person when I look in the mirror. I know that I'm as good as dead on account of my sins, which is, which is funny that I could even pray a prayer, Lord, come quickly, right? But I can pray it because I can pray it confidently because I know that precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. I can pray it because I know that Jesus shared in my humanity and he knows what I'm living in, and he wants me as a loving God and a loving father, he wants me to be with him, okay? So some of the story gives us insight, but not necessarily. That's the point that I wanted to make about that. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. That's where I said it's a story. And it, you vote for angels? Okay. I will pray very specifically then, Joyce, that God sends angels. That's why I'm telling you it's a story. And it is, it is um, descriptive, but perhaps not prescriptive of how it's going to happen. Does that help? So I knew that I, you know, because we've been talking about death and stuff, I knew that I was going to have to address that. And we were driving back. We were out of town yesterday, and on the way back, um, there was a billboard that we saw somewhere outside of Harrison, I think it was, and it was citing from the story that I told today, or that Jesus told in Luke 16 today. It's the only place that he tells that particular story, and I'm like, oh, I guess i got to think about that when I talk about it in Bible class, too. So, check. Did that one, too. All right. Um, what else does God do? Um, physical death has not been eliminated for the Christian but it has lost its effect. 
That's important to note. So physical death, while it's not removed from us completely, it's lost its effect on us. Where, O oh, death, is your sting, right? So that's not the one I'm going to read from. Let's read from 2 Timothy 1 is the, is the passage. Therefore, do not be ashamed about the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, Paul writes to Timothy, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I've talked to you guys about this before, that Jesus was described as the protetikon necros in Greek. That is the firstborn of the dead of whom others will follow. And we have not yet followed. We have not come through death to be raised immortal and glorious yet. This is why we would fight against Gnosticism today as a heresy. Gnostics believe that, oh, well, when I die, I'm going to become an angel, and I'm going to go to heaven on my, with my angel wings, and I'm going to have my harp and, and play my harp in the heavenly bliss and glory for forever. No, if that's what you think is the end, you're sadly mistaken. Our hope is a resurrection from the dead and a life everlasting. That's what we confess in the creeds. Gnosticism says, spiritualism is the best. And this is why I hate that phrase, well, I'm more spiritual than I am religious. Shut up. You don't even know what you are, is the way I feel about that when I hear that from people. I just want to tell them how dumb they sound. You tell me, you mean you reveal to me that you don't know anything about the scriptures when you say something like that. Or people that say, well, I'm a Christian, but I just don't go to church. Shut up. I get that way too. You don't know what you're talking about because if you believe Jesus in his word, you would listen to what he says. And one of the things he says is, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, which we talked about earlier, and I'm not going to recap for you here. I get upset with people when they don't really know what they're talking about, and then they claim to have knowledge. That's a problem. And Gnosticism is a present and real problem today that is being taught in churches that call themselves Christian today. And it's bad news because people think, well, death is the end. That's, when, that's why I want to die. That's why walking into a room and seeing a vern and trying to encourage him out of that, well, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Woo, I'd go get my angels and I'm done. No, death is bad. Death brings about grief and sadness and sorrow. Ask anybody that's experienced it. Right? And they'll tell you the truth about it. But what we know, as I said, is that the sting of death has lost its total effect. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15, oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't get to hear well done, good and faithful servant until we're raised from the dead. You don't get to hear it when you, when you um, uh, die and you, your soul is being comforted. All those souls that are being comforted in heaven in this interim state that we're waiting for, that they are doing the same thing you and I are doing right now. Read Revelation 6, 9 if you don't believe me. They're going, how long, O Lord? How long before you avenge the blood of our brothers who have been killed for your testimony? How long before you raise the dead? How long before Jesus returns? A little while longer. A little while longer. A little while longer. And this is where I go to 2 Peter chapter 3. You guys want to take a look at that one with me? Um. Pete's probably there already. Pete's already in Peter because he's looking it up on his phone. But Do not overlook this one. This is starting at verse 8. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he's patient toward you. That's why he hasn't come yet. He's patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish. So we got work to do. We got to glorify God, right? Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance, a great reversal. If you heard me before. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. The heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. 
Since all these things are to be thus, thus dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be? Leading lives of holiness and godliness. Glorifying God, I would add. Waiting for, hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved. And the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We're waiting for. We're presently waiting for it. The people, the souls who are in heaven right now are also waiting for it. It's not it, what they got right now. And that's important to note, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Philippians 1, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Glorifying God is the, is the goal and the purpose of Christians, which is exactly what Paul's telling us right here in Philippians 1. It is my hope that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. What did I tell you when it came to, at the very beginning of the study, when I said, okay, when you're planning for your death, what do you use? You use every opportunity. Your body is meant as a vessel to glorify God. You use every opportunity at your disposal to glorify God. So while I'm alive, and as I write my, my um, own obituary or coach my family in the things that I want included in my obituary, it ain't about me because now I'm writing about me. Oh, he was an excellent golfer. Oh, he was a really a marksman. You know, he could shoot a duck out of the sky like crazy. That's why he missed church every Sunday during duck season. <laughs> Stop with that stuff. Put in your obituary the things that glorify God. Your body, your life is meant for one purpose and one purpose alone, to glorify God. Not you, okay? That's what Paul's getting after right here. Death is described in Scripture as sleep, okay? But it's not a soul sleep. Some churches teach soul sleep. So when you die, it's as if, like last night when I went to bed, I got to tell you, Saturday nights, I never sleep well, ever because I'm always afraid I'm going to miss my alarm in the morning and then let you guys all down. So I have always fitful, restless sleep. And then Amy's not here, so I can talk about her. So she falls asleep on the couch downstairs, and then she'll come to bed sometime between 1 and 3 in the morning and wake me up. And then when I'm woke up, then I'm thinking, ah, you know, now that I'm awake, I'm thinking, should I use the restroom? And then I lay there and I think about it for 30 minutes. So I just know now at this point in my life, just get up and go use it so that you don't lay here and think about should I use it or shouldn't I use it? <laughs> so then I'm up and then I'm back down again. And, and um, we think of sleep like soul sleep is how it's going to be for us. It's as if we fall asleep and then we wake up and resurrection is right then and we miss everything. No. It's described as sleep. So 1 Kings 2.10, David slept with his fathers, was buried in the city of David. We're borrowing biblical language when we talk about sleep. Daniel 12, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So he's talking about the resurrection, right? Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. But he talks about it as sleep. Matthew 9, Jesus said, go away. The girl is not dead, but sleeping. So we get this word for sleep. 1 Thessalonians 4, this is one I use at funerals for giving hope. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do that have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. That is prescriptive. There will be Christians alive on earth when Christ returns. But many will also be asleep and laid to rest. But it's not soul sleep where they're unawares of what's going on. Why can we say this? Because the scriptures say this. Luke 16, the poor man died. And what are we hearing here? This is where I said, we have to use some of this stuff. But is it prescriptive? That's why we can't just use this one only. The poor man died, was carried by the angels to Abraham's side along with Joyce. <laughs> the rich man also died and was buried and in Hades being in torment he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far, and la far off and Lazarus set aside he called out Father Abraham have mercy on me send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water cool my tongue I'm in anguish in this flame they're awares of their existence Jesus described it as such 
Now, it's a story, it's a parable. So as I just moments ago with you all sort of discredited it all in a sense and said, hey, wait, it's a story. So we can't take it all as though it's gospel truth, like this is how it's always going to go. We can still look at it, but we got to look elsewhere because scripture interprets scripture. So we can't just pluck doctrine and understanding from only one place in the scripture. We got to look elsewhere. So we look elsewhere and we look to Revelation 20. And in Revelation 20, it says, Then I saw thrones. Seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received the mark of their foreheads on their hands. They came to life. They were there. The souls were there, and they were aware of what was going on. We can look other places as well. Revelation 6, 9, I told you. Here's the beauty of this. This is another thing that God does for us to give us peace and comfort right now is saints, that's you all. It's not just the football team in New Orleans. That's you guys. The saints don't have to wait for God's comfort. See, a lot of people go, oh, well, you know, I can't wait to die to be comforted by God. You know what? God doesn't want you to have to wait that long. He'll give you comfort right this moment. And that is by letting you in on the inside track. Guess what? Don't worry. Got this one. Jesus is raised from the dead and you will be too. Persist in the faith. Don't reject the work of God's Holy Spirit. And Jesus talks to a thief on the cross who's hanging next to him. And he doesn't want him to be in peril. He's already in peril in that moment. He's hanging on a cross and he's about to die. But Jesus knows that through the called word, the spoken word, the word made flesh, speaks words of comfort to him. And he says, the thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus doesn't want him to suffer any more than he already is. And he lets him in on the inside track. Today, today I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. And that's a word that endures even to today. So for me, I might face some difficulty in the day Beyond here with you guys, this isn't difficult. This I enjoy. This is, this is the greatest, to be with the body of Christ gathered, hearing the word of the Lord. But things could go dreadfully wrong today, you know, from here on out. And I'll need that peace and comfort and knowledge from God that today he's with me and he's got me. We need that all the time. That's why I can't imagine people that would want to go any more than seven days and not get it. And I want to go even fewer, so I got to quit. I almost got it. You know how close I was? What's that? I didn't do that with the I can just picture you going. <laughs> no, I'll tell you how probably it happened is spell check. Anybody else been victim to a spell check? Yeah, my life is, is determined by that. So, All right, we are so close to the end, it's not even funny. I really thought I was going to get it. I had two more points and I could have finished. So we'll, we'll finish them next time, and then we'll pick up with the new stuff as we gather. Thank you.